Okay, I'm here with Ken Gerhard, who's a well-known and respected cryptozoologist uh, in the field. Uh, Ken, I definitely appreciate your time. I know you're a pretty busy man. Well, thank you for having me on, Chris. It's definitely an honor and a pleasure to be with you uh, here today. And, um, and as always, I'm excited to talk about cryptozoology. Uh, okay, great. And it's, you know, I have the same interest in... You know, I'm trying to get to pick people's brains like yours who are the experts in it. Um, what, I'll start with, what would you say is the most underrated monster slash creature? I mean, we all hear about the Bigfoots and the common ones. What one, in your opinion, is the most underrated? Oh, gosh, underrated. Well, um, man, it's tough, but I'd say it's, it's probably a tie, in my opinion. Now, uh, I think the most oft-neglected cryptids are the, the sea monsters and lake monsters and things. Now, of course, most people have heard of the Loch Ness Monster and Champ and Ogopogo and some of those. But um, there's so much evidence in terms of, you know, hundreds or thousands of eyewitness accounts around the world, uh, very, you know, corroborating descriptions uh, native legends and, you know, reports that date back centuries and even in modern times. So, and, you know, even the most conservative scientists will tell you that there are probably things in the ocean, large things in the ocean that we haven't discovered yet. So there's definitely a, a strong chance, I think, that there are some, some uh, amazing animals that have yet to be discovered in the ocean depths. But for me personally, I'm very passionate about thunderbirds. Thunderbirds, um, not a lot of people are familiar with them, but, um, you know, there's a there are Native American legends, many different Native cultures that talk about these thunderbirds, these giant eagles, eagle-like birds, uh, with a wingspan, you know, 15 to 25 feet across. And uh, a lot of these thunderbirds have been kind of put on totem poles and depicted in different Native art and things. But uh, I get a lot of modern sightings. Uh, a lot of people will reach out to me that have had encounters with these enormous raptor-like birds, and they don't fit with anything that we know of, you know, in, in the science books. The largest known birds, you know, only have wingspans like 10 or 11 feet across. So you're talking about someone with a 15, 20-foot wingspan. That's a big bird. So, I mean, those... those uh, sightings are pretty remarkable to me. Uh, and where are the most common uh, sightings for the Thunderbirds that occur? Well, there's some hot spots, and I don't know why this is the case because some of the areas don't necessarily line up as far as the types of habitats you might expect. Uh, but here in my home state of Texas, uh, uh, I get a number of reports, particularly down in the southern portion of the state by uh, the border with Mexico. Uh, those date back to the 1970s, and I've written a book about them. Um, the state of Illinois uh, gets a lot of reports. There are some very famous cases there from the 70s, and I, I continue to get a lot of modern sightings from Illinois. Uh, Pennsylvania, traditionally, particularly north-central Pennsylvania in the Susquehanna River Valley, Black Mountains. And uh, recently I've gotten a lot of reports from Alaska and from the Rocky Mountains. And those, those to me are the most exciting reports because when you're talking about, you know, Alaska and the wilderness area that you have there, the, the mountain ranges and, and also the Rocky Mountains, now you're talking about a habitat that would be very viable for something like a Thunderbird to actually exist. Oh, yeah, that's... And, you know, a lot of people, obviously the skeptics who... You know, I don't believe in, like, the obvious big one now is Bigfoot. And, you know, I what's your thoughts on Bigfoot? What is your opinion of what or who it is or can be? Well, Bigfoot is obviously the, you know, the big iconic cryptid in the field of cryptozoology. Um, so polarizing, such an amazing subject, particularly because these things, whatever they are, they, they appear to be so man-like, right? They walk up on their hind legs. A lot of people have described them as looking very human in the face, as seeming to be very intelligent. Um, unfortunately, the field is kind of a mess right now because you have a lot of politics involved with people trying to push their own agendas, uh, faking photos and evidence or, you know, whatever they're trying to do. And then there's a lot of people out there that are kind of playing the, 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 the supernatural card now, that they think Bigfoot is some type of interdimensional being moving through different dimensions and doorways, which I guess you can't say it's impossible, but it's just, you know, it's pretty hard to, to prove something like that. Um, personally, I think, you know, Bigfoot does exist. Uh, studied it for years and there's really a lot of evidence when you look at all the 
eyewitness sightings and legends. The description is very similar. Uh, the Patterson film, some of the footprints that have been found and cast. So there's a lot of stuff that adds up. And I think the most reasonable thing to say would be that Bigfoot is, is probably some type of relic hominid that is a man-like subhuman type form, something that we may or may not know from the fossil history, uh, you know, for millions of years before Homo sapiens, there were these kind of subhuman, uh, you know, primitive types that took off on different branches, and a lot of them walked upright like we did, but they, you know, they were more along the intelligence of apes. So, you know, you have people talk about Gigantopithecus and Homo erectus, Megantopus, uh, the Australopithecines, so, you know, who knows, but it's, it's obviously something that was supposed to have gone extinct and it didn't, and uh, they're very intelligent and they're very elusive and they live in remote areas, and they've probably adapted to avoid contact with humans, since we're competing for the same niche, and so that's why we haven't found them yet, because they're highly intelligent, nomadic, uh, live in remote areas, and they're probably nocturnal, for the most part. Okay, and that's, you know, a qu my personal question I have is, why do you think, well, two-part. One, why do you think we're getting more reports of sightings? And two, when people get a sightings, do you think it's by accident, or are they meant to be seen? Uh, good questions. Um, you know, in terms of uh, frequency of sightings, um, I think a lot of that, you know, would have to do with a couple, you know, the two main factors, one being that we're infringing more and more on their wilderness areas of the world. You know, those are sort of shrinking. And as humans tend to push farther into those remote wilderness areas, we're going to definitely have more encounters with things that are, you know, have moved into those areas to avoid us. Uh, the second thing, of course, is awareness. And, you know, you have some very successful shows on TV now, like Finding Bigfoot and uh, Survivor Man and things where, you know, where Bigfoot is constantly in the, in the public eye. And, you know, it's a hot topic around the uh, water cooler at work or whatever. And so, you know, people that have had sightings, maybe they've been reluctant to talk about them for years. Uh, they didn't want to get questioned or, or, you know, criticized. But uh, now they're feeling comfortable enough to come forward and talk about their sightings. Um, and I'm sorry, was there a second part to that question or did I really want too much about No, no, you yeah. frequency is yeah, no, that was good, the frequency, like you said, because of the habitat, and, you know, one thing that we were both talking about uh, before we went on the air is all these videos that are surfacing online, and we both said take them with a grain of salt, like everybody's trying to jump on the bandwagon, and you being the expert, I know if I thought I caught a Bigfoot on video, one of the first things I would do is I would go to where I seen it and see if I could get a photo or a casting of a footprint, but yet yeah. none of these people do. They just show the video. Yeah, yeah. As, as I mentioned, uh, you know, before we got on air, I'm not a big proponent of video evidence in terms of Bigfoot. Uh, there's just too many videos out there now that are floating around that are just very subjective and ambiguous where you see, a, you know, a, a hairy something moving around through the trees, but it's covered up. Could be a man in a suit. You know, there are a lot of people that want to fake these things now, get their, their 15 seconds of fame on YouTube. But, you know, the bottom line is that photographic evidence is just not good evidence when you're talking about something remarkable like Bigfoot. Uh, the video would have to be absolutely jaw-dropping. And the, I think the only video that most researchers uh, stand behind, uh, you know, is the Patterson film, which is the famous film footage from the 60s. And for a couple of reasons. One of the things is hiding behind brush. It's not obscured. It's not out of focus. You can clearly see the thing walking right across the clearing uh, by a creek. And uh, two, you know, this was filmed in 1967. So this was long before Photoshop and uh, special effects and things like that. Costumes weren't that good. So, I mean, you, when you look at the thing in that footage, you're like, wow, if this is fake, how did this guy pull this off in 1967? It looks too real. Um... So, but other than that, man, there's just, you know, I get people send me video clips all the time, and they're just always very disappointing. I just don't, I don't see a lot of promise there in terms of evidence. Okay, now the one thing I, you know, to jump to another cryptid is, you know, the Chukacabra. And, you know, we're going to talk about you, you know, possession that you have of the tongue. 
uh, for people that didn't watch or know about it, if you can go into more detail about that. Well, the clarification I always have to make right off, because a lot of people ask me, you know, well, how come the chupacabra that we heard about back in the 1990s in Puerto Rico was this weird reptilian-like creature that was standing on tiny legs, had these giant bulging eyes, kind of like some kind of alien reptile creature, gargoyle. And then, you know, here in, in the 2000s, we've been getting these uh, these so-called chupacabras that have turned up all over Texas and elsewhere that basically are, are dog-like animals, canids. Um, and, I, I, you know, I, I think that it's just one of those things where the name chupacabra has maybe become a little bit uh, too common in the vernacular, and so people are using it for a lot of different things. But uh, as far as the animals here in Texas that are called chupacabras, I don't really refer to them as, as those. Uh, they're not legendary. They, you know, there are known animals that we've they've been DNA tested. I've got, like you mentioned, I've got some tissue samples in my freezer that I collected from an animal back in 2012 um, that was basically a you know, I'm sorry, 2009, it was uh, an animal that had been roadkilled in Texas, it looked really weird, it was hairless, but it was a dog, it was a dog-like animal, you could tell immediately by looking at its, uh, you know, uh, physical properties, but, you know, compared to some of these other animals that have been found in Texas that look really weird and that have been alleged to drink blood, and that's the key component, is that the name Chupacabra is Spanish for goat sucker, and it pertains to the, the belief that these animals, whether they're here in Texas or down in Puerto Rico, and regardless of what they look like, that they actually drink the blood uh, of small farm animals like vampires, basically. Uh, there's no evidence that I've seen that that's going on. Um, but, the, you know, as far as the tissue sample that I've had in my freezer here, we finally got a DNA test recently for a new TV show called Truth Supernatural. And they're telling me that the, the DNA came back as a domestic dog. So it's just basically a plain old dog, but it did look really weird. It didn't have any hair, it had weird looking teeth, and uh, its front legs were kind of short. So it was just kind of a weird looking dog, but it's uh, definitely not a chupacabra, I don't think. <laughs> Teeth <laughs> closed. Yeah, that's, you know, because like I said, the sightings, and that's, you know, why one, that's one of the things that interests me, is because the sight, a lot of these sightings seem to be out, you know, out west in your way, Texas, and you know, the the western states, you know, here in New England, we don't have a lot, you know, by well, the not, big... No, it's not really up there, no, but um, uh, you guys did have a weird-looking dog-like animal in Maine years ago. I forget what it was called, but it was kind of a shaggy-looking dog-like animal, and I think they figured out what that was. But as far as the, the, the hairless animals, and, you know, that people are calling chupacabras, and I'll go ahead and put this out there, we're calling them, a lot of researchers are now calling them the Texas Blue Dogs, because we know they're canids dogs. They have a weird bluish color to their skin when they, their hair falls out, so they're kind of weird looking, but uh, I, I have gotten a lot of reports lately from um, other states, including Oklahoma, Mississippi, Tennessee, Georgia, so most of the, the uh, animals you hear about are here in Texas, but they seem to be Whatever the condition is, and it could either be a disease or it could be a genetic thing, uh, mutation, it, it seems to be spreading outward uh, across the country. So it wouldn't surprise me, Chris, if you did see some of those up in Maine at some point. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, that's, you know, a couple, like I said, there's a lot of these things, and, you know, it's such a big interest. And, you know, like a lot of people, you know, John Keel, you know, when he wrote, you know, The Prophecies of a Mothman, Yep, John Keel, definitely. And you know, I, it's that's another creature that really interests me a lot because it's really they all do like you. It's because trying to figure out there's so many that people don't realize that are out there. You know, if you look them up, everybody again they hear the common ones, and if like the Thunderbirds and all the less common ones, you know, that's what well, we well, hope to yeah. bring. Well, Mothman is definitely in a, cat, in a class by itself. It's not r really fairly belongs in the field of cryptozoology because it seems to be something more along like a supernatural type of creature, being, entity. But you're right. John Keel first wrote the Mothman Prophecies, brought it to public attention. It's an amazing story. And, uh, in fact, my newest book, uh, which is called Encounters with Flying Humanoids, uh, talks about the Mothman and uh, quite a bit and other creatures like Mothman that have been sighted around the world. Uh, John Keel, of course, is one of my idols growing up, but I do have to say that um, in the course of doing the research, 
research for my book and also going back and reviewing a lot of his writing, I think Keel was definitely onto some things, but I think he was also a little bit of a romantic and that sometimes he may have kind of hyped up certain aspects of what, you know, what he was involved in in the investigation and so forth. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, I think it's important for people to look at the, the wide body of evidence in terms of Mothman, and there are other people that are writing about it that have done research, that have interviewed the eyewitnesses and stuff. So but it's a great, it's a fascinating mystery, and uh, definitely something that uh, anyone who's interested in the unexplained would, would, would love to read about, I think. Oh, okay. That's great. You know, I know your time is limited, so is there, you know, you have any upcoming projects or anything that we can watch for? Well, um, I, I'm on a new TV show called Proof Supernatural that just debuted on uh, Destination America Network, and uh, I think that'll probably be replaying over the next, uh, the coming weeks. I've got some TV projects that I'm not at liberty to talk about, but hopefully those will air later this year. Uh, I'm currently working on a new book that covers a whole uh, range of cryptozoology uh, topics, lots of things that are investigated that have never been published and so forth. And uh, as far as public appearances go, if you have any listeners that live in the uh, greater St. Louis uh, area, I will be appearing at the Haunted America Conference uh, next month, June 20th, in Alton, Illinois, and I'll be doing a lecture about Thunderbirds there. So, um, and the, you know, there'll be some other cool speakers there talking about different aspects of the unexplained as well. Oh, okay, great. Um, you know, again, thank you very much for your time, because uh, I know you're extremely busy, and, uh, you know, hopefully down the road we get to chat again. Sounds great, Chris. Thanks again for having me on, and thanks to everyone who listened in, and yeah, let's do it again sometime. Great, thank you. Have a great night. All right, you too. Okay. Bye-bye.